Welcome to Dark Aspects of Nintendo, an ongoing series of videos where I take the most innocuous looking games from this history family friendly company and try to find any adult themes hidden within. In addition to covering 5 different Nintendo game related books for this series, I've reviewed 27 games in total, making this the 28th, which is fitting as this year marks the game's 28th birthday, as well as my own, so one of these babies is actually me. I do have a bit of a dark confession to make myself before we begin though. Before preparing this video, I had beaten Yoshi's Island DS, Yoshi's New Island, and even poorly regarded spin-offs like Yoshi Topsy Turvy, but never the original. I grew up with a Super Nintendo and began playing the thing before I could even speak full sentences, but to my knowledge we never owned or rented this cartridge. The first Yoshi adventure I fell in love with then was Yoshi's story on the N64. So going back and fully experiencing the game that directly preceded it left a very positive impression on me. I never realized just how influential this adventure was to Paper Mario either, one of my top 5 favorite games of all time. There's the large, sometimes literally, variants of Shy Guys and their sillier personalities than previously seen, along with a ton of other unique baddies and bosses that were all born from Yoshi's Island, then carried over to this other, other Mario RPG. The only element that nearly turned me away from completing this game were the requirements for 100%, namely these infuriating Shy Guys holding red coins who briefly appear to tease you, then fly away and never come back. If their red coin isn't retrieved in that short window of time, there isn't another opportunity, so you'll have to restart the level. I can't tell you how many times I've reached the gold ring with 30 stars, all 5 flowers, and 19 out of 20 red coins. In most every case, the one I missed was dangling underneath this snickering son of a mask somewhere off screen. Before I had the chance to spot him, of course. And you have to 100% the course all in one go for the score to even count. Can't stay mad at them forever. Much like all of the adorable enemies without a mask that get in the way. These small, Kirby-esque pink puffballs, for example, look like they're just happy to be alive. Unfortunately for the longevity of their species, though, whenever Yoshi squashes them under his boots, the little fellas just burst in the most satisfying way. These living creatures are cursed with the appeal of popping bubble wrap. It's similar to the Kremlin's Death Grunt from Donkey Kong Country on the same system. An oddly cathartic sound rewarded from the noble sacrifice of a foot soldier, now flattened like a pancake. Something else that's pretty messed up are the mischievous monkeys debuting in this game. In Super Mario 64, they simply try to steal Mario's hat, but on Yoshi's home turf, they can steal Mario himself. I know that most of these monkeys, called grinders in this game for some reason, are antagonistic and apparently allied with Kamek, but some of them are harmless, so it's funny to me that Yoshi can still swallow them and seal the cheeky lads eternally inside of an egg. Baddies like these bumpties can't be digested, but I suppose that since their kind don't outwardly attack anyone, the penguins are more of a nuisance than a threat, and therefore aren't dangerous enough to make Yoshi's blacklist. They're actually one of a few exceptions, as there aren't many inhabitants of the island he can trust. There are even phony flowers called Dizzy Dandies, or Fooly Flowers, that try and mock the real ones you're supposed to collect, but thankfully feature an unmissable scowl, acting as your hint that they will drop and abruptly begin rolling with animosity. Don't think you can hide out safely in the water either, as these so-called lungfish lungefish, can patrol the surface waiting to devour not just Yoshi, but the live cargo on his back too. The chomps of this game are similarly kind of terrifying, so Link's Awakening this is not. Besides these standard chain chomps, appearing as early as level 1-2, simply titled Watch Out Below, there are these gigantic chainless chomps called incoming chomps that wait in the background, then very suddenly strike by leaping towards the screen and crashing down into the ground beneath Yoshi, creating a bottomless pit. A single, crudely drawn warning sign at the beginning of the level is the only indication of what's to come. And even if you put the pieces together before disaster strikes, this chomp far in the distance minding its own business, then abruptly launching into the foreground is surely enough to catch even attuned players off guard. This is followed by five more of them, leaping and then slamming down into the depths of the earth, probably taking a poor unsuspecting shy guy along with them. Sometimes their drop down can be delayed, so a sigh of relief can only really be felt once Yoshi's sheltered and out of the danger zone. In my opinion, the shark chomp that guards levels like Marching Mildy's Fort later on is far worse, as there is nothing hinting at this new threat. You're simply thrust into a flight or flight response. You heard me right, there is no fight here, as it incessantly hunts Yoshi, requiring a sprint to the right as slowing down will ensure that our beloved dinosaur friend will become a tasty lunch. The rabid chomp stalks its prey until the breakable platforms are all eaten through, and it bites down right into a nice chunk of solid brick, causing its front teeth to crack and a single tear to be shed as it drops down in defeat. 
It's now a better time than ever to talk about what happens when you lose baby Mario, which isn't as mortifying as losing a baby Yoshi in Yoshi's story, but is still unnerving as letting the timer tick down until it hits zero, which is anxiety provoking enough with an alarm noise paired with baby Mario's crying, causes Kamek's gang of minions, the Toadies, to swoop in out of nowhere, pop the protective bubble carrying the star child, and kidnap him. There's a slow fade to black, then a quick fade in of the creepy pre-rendered toadies hovering in front of the black void. One of them faces the screen very quickly and laughs, and they all fly away with Mario while rudimentary game over text appears and erratically flips around. Then when the animation calms down, it happens again when the downbeat music stops. This has the same fearful flavor from lots of similar game over screens plus anti-piracy and error messages of the time, like this infamous image showing a bruised up donkey and Diddy in a void of darkness, standing behind a shoddy wooden game over sign. There's a reason that if you look up videos of these screens on YouTube, the comments are filled with viewers expressing how it used to scare them as kids, a sentiment I personally relate to. I think there's something innately off-putting about these sudden cut-to-black transitions, whether the game's not working properly or you lost all of your characters' lives, featuring depressing-sounding music or lack of a song entirely, either by itself, played alongside our downtrodden heroes, or set to a villain laughing. It helps bring out this inherent feeling that something is seriously wrong, and that you shouldn't be seeing this screen. This next talking point isn't exactly dark, it's just very unexpected to find in the first world of a Yoshi game. Stage 1-7, Touch Fuzzy, Get Dizzy, introduces an interesting stage mechanic in these floating spores called fuzzies, which are very different from the enemies of the same name from Super Mario World, wherein touching one doesn't hurt Yoshi physically, but sends him on a figurative trip to the moon as his eyes open wide and change color. With the green Yoshi sprite, they're shown to be orange, pink in the Game Boy Advance port, which I think is similar enough to them looking bloodshot in both cases. Flirting with these funny fuzzies also causes the screen to bend and warp while cycling through vivid, vibrant colors. One of the first things you notice is the clouds are like, you know, swimming. <laughs> you know, the, the trees are blowing, and blowing rocks, you know, are rocks are rolling. Rock can roll. Yeah, that's right. That was a real ad for the game, by the way, as was this unmistakably 90s gross-out commercial where a man gorges on huge quantities of food to so lovingly and, uh, subtly symbolize how much content they crammed into this game, as his stomach expands and belt buckle breaks until his belly rivals birth the bashfuls. Instead of delightfully deflating like a balloon, however, taking one more bonus bite disgustingly causes him to KABOOM! And the overwhelming amount of grub he just ate spews out to decorate the diner. A glob of once ingested spaghetti even lands on the game's beautiful box, blasphemously defiling it. I wonder how much it could sell at auction now. Ungraceful Monty Python references aside, let's get back to getting dizzy. While under the influence of this E-rated drug, Yoshi leans forward and stumbles around, even without input from the player, which could cost a life if you're not careful. In the Super Mario Advance 3 Player's Guide, the enemy class that these perilous puffs are uniquely classified under is called Dude I'm Freaking Out On This, and the German name for their debut level translates to Lustigisch Vorhin Drama, or LSD for short. Touch Fuzzy Get Dizzy was directly referenced years later in Super Paper Mario, then a couple of times after that in Yoshi's Woolly World and Mario Party's Star Rush. With as many fuzzies as there are drifting through the wind on screen, it's very difficult to avoid them all. Not that I even try to, between you and me I always purposely ingest them to see the pretty colors. In the video game. Don't do drugs, kids. Speaking of, how many of these spores do you think Baby Mario was exposed to? That can't be healthy, even if it doesn't seem to directly affect him. Yet. Though the fuzzies can admittedly be a little frustrating once the novelty wears off, I'm a big fan of these creatures and stage hazards that are able to disorient the player by messing with their controls. Earthbound's mushroomization ailment, Captain K. Rule's blunderbuss shooting poisonous clouds, and Donkey Kong Country 3's chemical gas levels are all interesting and literally intoxicating. Another way the inputs are unsolicitedly altered on a Super Nintendo controller are not only these aforementioned fuzzies, but also the wonderfully eerie Grim Leechers, appearing exclusively in the Impossible Maze level and Mystery of the Castle in the GBA version. These purple ghosties wearing style and skull masks seem to keep to themselves until Yoshi draws near, which is when they turn hostile and give Baby Mario the boot to hitch a ride on Yoshi themselves. When the Grim Leecher attaches itself to our protagonist, Yoshi will flash colors and remain pink while movement is reversed until the parasite is removed. 
The background music for this confounding level is also the unnervingly somber Room Before Boss track. That's enough talking about bonus levels though, as it's time to home in on the sixth and final world, Koopa Kingdom. Getting here involves facing off against Raphael, leader of the Ravens, who's enlarged by Kamek's magic, like all other bosses in the game with exception to Prince Froggy, who stays a normal size but is able to swallow Yoshi when Kamek unexpectedly uses his magic to shrink our hero instead. The fight with Raphael does subvert expectations in another way, however, as after he's sprinkled with the usual magic dust, he bum-rushes Yoshi with enough force to send him on a trip to the moon, literally this time. He then proceeds to fly there himself, initiating a Super Mario Galaxy-esque battle which makes me a little dizzy looking back on this footage. Or maybe that's just a residual effect from the fuzzies? Regardless, smacking this bad bird thrice on the booty banishes him to forever twinkle in the heavens like Kamek's threat to Yoshi and his castle explodes. Strangely, Yoshi is then raised from the cloud where the Raven's Fortress sat on top of seconds prior and begins to glow. The screen transitions and Yoshi is transported to what looks like an isolated dark version of his island surrounded by blackness rather than the ocean. This Koopa Kingdom is where Kamek and baby Bowser hail from, and is where the captured baby Luigi is being held, along with the poor stork, no doubt tortured for information about baby Mario's whereabouts. Definitely tortured. The overworld music is now livelier than ever at this point, but the accompanying visuals are anything but, showcasing a wasteland occupied by shy guy ghosts and ominously littered with skulls. The preview image of the first level fixates on a skeleton version of the cute goonie birds native to Yoshi's Island, which was a little jarring to see for the first time when they appeared without warning in a previous level. Unlike their living counterparts, these flying skeletons cannot be mounted. Jumping on one will instead cause them to lose their bony wings, then drop down and hit the ground before freakishly walking around as a detached head with little feet. Getting into the actual stage, it's made clear that the atmosphere will be quite different from here on out. Instead of the normal athletic theme, this chorus plays the underground music, set to a solemn sunset in an unsettling forest filled with remnants of Yoshi skeletons. Within the game's data too, there exists a walk cycle for a complete Yoshi skeleton, along with a shy guy riding one. It even has a jumping and collapsing animation. All of the remaining levels are similarly dispiriting in some way. You'll have to brave a cave of bandits, persevere through subground labyrinths, and keep moving in all caps with four exclamation points, featuring the last appearance of the notorious Shark Chomp. This of course all leads to the final confrontation against our two main foes. Kamek cannot be challenged directly as he's invulnerable to anything but baby Bowser apparently, but he does swoop in to try and take Yoshi out, not on a date he wants to kill him, and casts a number of damaging spells on the way to the Koopa Prince's playroom. That's not the worst chase sequence in the level though, not by a long shot. We'll get to the big one of course, but first I would be remiss not to mention an optional hot pursuit found behind door number 3. A lone information block appears before a pipe leading to this side attraction, and has just one thing to say, RUN AWAY HURRY! This to the point text is honestly a little eye opening, as no other tips from these message blocks have been this blunt. It almost reminds me of something you'd see in a creepypasta ROM hack, though future Yoshi games have fun with these foreboding hints, like Crafted World's unnaturally spaced if he sees you run away. That's in the killer clown doll level be afraid of the dark if you're wondering. Anyway, heading down this pipe has Yoshi descend into a lava cave, while the big boss music surprisingly plays, where a special invincible variant of the mid-world boss named Tap Tap the Golden eagerly waits to stalk Yoshi. Sure, the thing isn't exactly fast, but the player can't truly outrun it with the auto scroll, and not even a well-timed egg toss can keep the lumbering spike ball at bay for good. It will even leap out of bottomless pits. Be especially careful during these downhill sections, as rather than slowly shuffling at a decline, it hops from the top to effortlessly catch Yoshi. Should you choose to provoke this impervious brute or avoid it entirely by going a different route, these traps ultimately fail to stop the little green guy, and Kamek pleadingly begs for him to leave and hand over the baby. Hey. The room is pitch black where he voices his commands, but in the corner of the room, two beady yellow eyes can be seen before the lights turn on and Kamek seriously starts panicking. In a fit, Baby Bowser excessively ground pounds his caretaker until he's paper thin. Is this technically the debut of Paper Kamek, and Paper Yoshi for that matter? Then rudely kicks him away. The first match against this tyrannical toddler is fairly straightforward. You have to more strategically execute the same tactic he's using to send shockwaves through the floor to trip him until he's exhausted. 
A revived Kamek then flies in to work his magic one last time, as Bowser fades into a silhouette that swells to fill the whole screen, while the ground begins trembling and the ceiling crumbles. What comes next is something else. After that transition, we're shown that the floor has warped underneath Yoshi's feet, the wall's been completely torn down, and the roof is caved in. A darkened landscape touched by the full moon at dusk spreads out far beyond the deteriorating castle, as an enormous shadowy figure rises from the abyss, towering over everything from a considerable distance. The beast raises its arms to the blackened sky above, deeply roaring to reveal a red void of a mouth. With his claws pointed skyward, the fallen rocks and debris from a few moments ago rise once more to be hurled at Yoshi, which breaks even more of the floor away. To emphasize what helps make this encounter legitimately scary, I'm going to bring up another parallel between these three Super NES games, Earthbound, Donkey Kong Country, and Yoshi's Island, in that their final boss themes all seriously rock out hard. The first phase of Earthbound's last battle starts us off with a song commonly referred to by Western fans unofficially as Pokey Means Business. It begins with a catchy, 8-bit sounding beat until 53 seconds in, when that opening act is knocked unconscious because a metal band just kicked down the door. Gangplank, Galleon similarly starts modestly with a jaunty pirate ditty before quieting down to make way for a bass drop and hair-raising electric guitar. When and how does Yoshi rival these tracks? Right away, with a slower electric guitar paired with a menacing drone that builds and builds until exploding into thrash metal. This song is so cool, and very effectively sets the scene while Yoshi turns with his back to the camera to face what is arguably the most frightening form of Bowser ever. Which is funny because he is still technically a baby here. To bring up another bit of related cut content, this was an early design of Big Baby Bowser that looks even more upsetting than what we got for the final version. I think it works to be a tad more off-putting because these sprites that went unused here are less detailed, obscuring all of his face except for those expressionless glowing white eyes. The proportions also look off, which makes for a very uncanny portrayal. I find it interesting that this beta Bowser has horns like his adult self, making me wonder if Miyamoto had wanted him to simply transform into a grown-up Bowser from Kamek's magic like the transformation he had initially envisioned for baby Mario when he grabs a star. That is, before the team settled on him simply remaining an infant and donning a cape. Getting back to the fight, the titan-sized turtle marches slowly towards the screen at first, spitting colossal fireballs that target and can easily knock Mario off of Yoshi. The ground shakes as Bowser ambles on, filling more and more of the player's vision until he's smacked back with an egg toss. If the player freezes in fear or fails to successfully land a hit, the OG Koopa Kid will quickly encompass your entire field of view, until he gets so close the castle floor disintegrates and Yoshi falls to his doom. The looming disaster always in sight is plenty disquieting, but what pushes this battle to be so stress-inducing is the fact that after nailing a couple of hits, the platform space shrinks yet again as more boulders are hurled your way, and Bowser speeds up, considerably. Before making him mad, the massive menace approached leisurely, which allowed ample time to dodge attacks and line up your own shot. Now fully fueled by rage and charging full steam ahead though, mistakes on behalf of the player are all the more likely. Watching this whopping demon sprint towards the screen while trying to act fast is intense, so it took me a few tries to smack the magic out of him, ultimately causing the Koopas to retreat. We sure did stomp those Koopas. It was a long and arduous journey, but it's all thanks to Yoshi that the twin babies are safe and reunited, rightfully ensuring future disaster will be brought to the Koopa family. 
At least until Yoshi's new island retconned their happy return by revealing the brothers were actually delivered to the wrong home. So the unfortunate Stork and all of the Yoshis have to endure the entire rigmarole again to get them to their real parents, because Kamek ambushes the former like this a second time. That's a story for another time. Okay, probably not, but I had a lot of fun covering both this game and Yoshi's story for Dark Aspects. So if there are any other past or present Yoshi adventures you'd like to see analyzed for this show, please be sure to leave a comment and let me know, even though the next episode has already been decided. It's another one of my all-time favorites, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Thank you all for watching, I hope to see you again soon.